All right, well, welcome to the Skagit Valley and Whidbey NMRA Clinic for February 2022. Uh, I'm Rich Blake, clinic chair. And tonight we're gonna have a cornucopia of mini clinics on rolling stock, weathering techniques, kit bashing, scratch building, super detailing the subject of rolling stock and, and how some of our different modelers here build those. Tonight, we're gonna have Susan and Phil Gonzalez, John Bentz, Alan Murray, Joe Green, and I have a little bit of, of stuff to show myself at the end. Phil and Susan, you are up first. Good evening, everybody. I'm not here to talk about anything but my favorite car that uh, I've got, and it just happens to be a beer car painted and, and lettered for the Sierra Nevada Brewing Company. The car itself is just a, a basic roundhouse refrigerator car. I, I painted it, I lettered it. It was uh, actually my first, what I like to think, a very successful paint job with an airbrush. The big thing about the car itself, why it's my favorite, is the backstory about the brewing company. I have had a fictitious Sierra Nevada Brewing Company on my railroad forever. A long time ago, a guy came to my house with a six pack of beer. And it was Duda beer. Now, I had never heard of Duda beer, made by a company called the Sierra Nevada Brewing Company. We, we had one big problem with the six pack of beer. We drank all the beer and tore up the labels before we could get them off. Called them up, told them what I needed, and they sent me all of these labels. Or you can see, you can't see the label, but it's right there and my brewing car back there. That's just my favorite car, everybody. And that's really just what I wanted to show you. I enjoyed a Sierra Nevada beer tonight, so I appreciate this. Yeah. <laughs> hey, that's awesome. So I like wood kits and I freelance. The Rio Como Railway Company presents kit-based cars of various types. Now, this first one is from a Mount Blue kit for a 22-foot narrow gauge box car. I uh, decided to build it as a weathered aged box car in LCL service. Does everybody know what LCL stands for? Less, Less than, than car, car load. load. Yeah. The doors are open and it'll be part of the mixed daily mixed train and probably right behind the uh, locomotive. I have not painted the trucks yet. Down the side, you can see the other side of the car. I did put brake rigging on it, added some additional grab irons, details here and there. I haven't put cut levers on it yet. And I've shown both ends of the car, one with a brake wheel and the other without the brake wheel. They have end doors that don't open. So it's kind of a typical narrow gauge, multi-purpose box car, but short. The thing I like about it, it's not as short as the Bachman 18 footers, which you know are cute, but they're a little too short. So the next car is one of about six that I purchased from Rich and Alan, and it came without any detail on it. I cut the original grab irons off and replaced them, added a little additional detail and cut levers on the ends, weathered it a bit, and changed out the trucks for Carter Brothers swing motion trucks. And it's a 24-foot box car. I don't know what that was built from. I think the guy scratch built these cars. They also came originally with some funky, real low profile ON3 wheel sets and trucks. So I switched all that out. So it raised the car. John, you didn't have to do decals. They came with RCRR already on them. That's why I like them, because <laughs> I didn't have to letter them. So I have five more of these to do. This is a kit bash Bachman coach that I uh, cut the sides off of and grafted on a Mount Blue combine that was designed to fit on a Bachman frame. So it's kind of a knockoff Southern Pacific narrow gauge coaches and baggage cars for uh, cabooses. So this is a, one of the cabooses on the, on the railroad. I added a roof walk and you can see the, the end view here with cut levers. And these are heavy duty West side trucks. So the thing probably rides like a buckboard. And again, that was a kind of serious bit of surgery and it, uh, it turned out okay. Uh, this is a fire car that was made out of a uh, Morgan Hill wooden tank car kit. All the end bracing and cross bracing was actually part of the uh, Morgan Hill kit. I added this platform on top 
a hose reel. This little gizmo opens up the water lid so it can be filled without the guy climbing out on this round surface. There's a toolbox. On the end of the car, there's a steam pump. So it would be hooked up to the steam uh, line from the locomotive to run the pump and fill the tank with water, cut levers and Carter swing motion trucks. And this is another Morgan Hill kit. It didn't include these rod bracing. Uh, this is based on a prototype West Side tank. I added a platform and a grant line caboose ladder that I chopped down to fit. There's a hose coiled up here on the end. This is used to deliver oil to mines and sawmills that use oil for their uh, boiler fuel. In the operating scheme of the layout, larger O and three size uh, tank cars are brought in to the main yard where it is transferred to oil tanks and then uh, the tanks are used to fill these smaller cars, which go up the branch lines, which have uh, more severe curves and clearance restrictions. And this is another Morgan Hill kit. I added uh, grab irons, and I also added these cross braces with rod, tie-down rods to hold the tank in place, added cut rods, and again, Carter swing motion trucks. Uh, also, this car does not have brakes. It has uh, a brake wheel on each end and a pass-through airline. That happened in uh, real life where some cars were not equipped with automatic brakes, air brakes. And finally, <clears throat> this is a wedge plow, plow that was made from a uh, West Side Powderhouse plow kit. And <clears throat> I used most of the wood from his kit because it came with a lot of notches and things cut out, which was nice. It saved a lot of work. And then I scratch built the wedge portion. This was originally a, a plow that only pushed the snow to one side. And I wanted it to be more of a wedge plow so it would go to either side. It's not designed for high speed operation. This is uh, intended to be just shoved slowly into uh, snow drifts. I built the uh, wooden box and a cross bracing and tie downs. This would be filled with scrap metal to add ballast and weight to the plow. And this has West Side prototype unsprung wooden beam uh, trucks. And that's it. Any questions? Amazing. So your cut levers, do you, do you make those from scratch or those... Um... You make a, you have a jig or something? What I do, I, I tailor it to the car. I use Wiseman cast brass loops. What are these? Um, anchors. And then custom uh, fit the wire to the, fit the car. So each one's a little bit different. This one's even simpler. Basically, they'll have two loops for the, the rod to pass through. It'll be bent out on the end to hold a chain that pulls the pin. And then there's the lever to pull, cut the car off. John, so, I have a question in the chat room about your weathering, which is terrific. Thank you. Uh, I use a lot of pan pastels. I've really come to like that stuff. It can be worked and overworked and reworked. <laughs> and if it, you really don't like it, you can erase it. And that's generally applied over an airbrushed finish. So I airbrush the trucks and the body and then come back and do the weathering with chalks. What, what kind of paint do you use? I have a stash of Floquil. Well, I know it's not good for you. I like the way it goes on. Um, there's just nothing quite like it. I do use acrylic and I'll be using acrylic to paint track. And I'm you know, eventually gonna have to convert to it because Floquil is getting more and more difficult to get. Although I scored a fresh bottle of oxide red a couple of weeks ago. But that, that's the way I do it now. It, it'll evolve. I'll, I've changed over the years the way I do stuff. But it just seems to be more comfortable for me to do a solid paint job and then come back and use the weathering powders. That's how I got the, streak, the streaks on the lettering by using a medium gray chalk. John, do you know what Ace Hardware has that would be a substitute for Floquel Diasol? That's a good question. I really haven't looked into that. Okay. 
I've been Wait. fortunate. I bought a, a quart of it 30 years ago, and it's still good. Is that lacquer or is it enamel? The original is a lacquer, and it uses a lacquer thinner. And then they changed the formulation late in the manufacturing scheme, and they changed to an enamel. And I really have never used much of that. I, I don't use a whole lot of different colors. I use boxcar red, oxide red, roof brown, grimy black, weathered black. I like their weathered black a lot, but that's really hard to find now. I noticed that access panel is at about a 30 degree angle. What? Tell me about that on the Which, tank car. Oh, on the tank car? Yeah. Let me go back. Yes, right there. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> What's all that about? That was cast into this piece. It's a resin casting, and that's the way it came from uh, Morgan Hill. So I just left it on there. Yeah, I think it's supposed to be a patch. Yeah, those are uh, patches on rust spots. Uh, you can see it on really old, old, old tenders yeah. that weren't maintained. Yes. Must not have had a level. <laughs> <laughs> it must have been the guy that owned my house before we moved here. Yeah. So the Morgan Hill, he's not making stuff anymore, is no, he? No, he's not. It's it's really kind of too bad because these were nice little kits. Yeah. I like the fact that his, his earlier ones had a, a wood frame. It was all pre-cut, so that part of it went together pretty quickly. I like the way wood looks. Uh, I haven't really gotten very good at uh, dealing with resin, although I, I have some resin kits I have to build. And this tank was resin, and the tank on the other one was resin as well, this one. All right. Well, those are awesome-looking models there, John. Well, thank you. They're a lot of fun. So next up, we have Alan Murray. He's going to give us an update on one of those skeleton cars he's working on. This is not a completed project. This is one that's just getting started, but it has kind of a funny story along with it. I call it the restoration of an O-scale 36-foot billboard, billboard reefer because of how it came to me. It's all Greg Wright's fault. And that's not to say that he did something bad, but it all started with one of the presentations done for, who, I can't remember whose layout it was in Olympia. And he told the story about how Greg Wright was inserting Olympia beer reefers on their layouts. Well, my father was the architect for the Olympia Brewing Company between 1958 and 1982. And so that piqued my interest. So I got a hold of Greg and he sent me a copy of the decal that came with it. He also had an Ambroid uh, HO kit, which then got me the decal, an Atlas 36 foot reefer this is what i purchased now you'll see you'll see the problems a little later the olympia reefer example from ambroid they suggested you, that the sides were white and the top and the ends were black looked like a good idea the undecorated as shown here looked like it's white let's look a little closer it was noted that certain things weren't there. Did I really get the same car that um, I was um, purchasing? So for example here, we have some tape. I didn't notice some tape. Also didn't notice that the truss rods that were available for this car were not there. When I got the item, I opened it up and we have the brake, pa uh, brake pads on one truck were missing. Brake hardware was incomplete. No truss rods, no screws to put, put the thing together or hold the trucks on. There were no couplers. And when I tried to remove hardware, a few items broke. So here you can see we're missing, for example, the, the uh, air tank here. Um, some other items, you can see here where the truss rods are supposed to go. You can see the empty screw pockets and of course no couplers. Here we have totally stripped down body and it's ready for paint. It had a bunch of uh, 
uh, brown haze on it. Looked like it might have been in a smoker's house. I was able to wash that all off. I only broke one piece, and that was one this part of this guy uh, on the other side. I ended up needing to buy a lot of pieces. Here's another, just another picture looking at the body. All the parts came off pretty easily. Uh, some of them are going to be kind of challenging to uh, put back in because they're pretty tiny. It's a good thing that uh, Atlas has a good line of parts. So you can see here, here's your, here's your brake pipe assemblies, here's your truss rods. You can buy doors if you want to. This is just only a small example. Um, and you can see the prices aren't too bad, you know, 575. But, you know, I got more into plastic parts that I ordered because I duplicated some of them than I had into the original purchase. Back to the Olympia beer. Thanks to John Bentz, he's helping me with the logos and then we're gonna, you know, create the, the decal sheets ourselves. So this is one that'll be on the right side of the door. And then we have this one and he's gonna change the color on the back. <clears throat> this will be on the left side of the door. I'm also gonna do the same thing on some Bachman cars. And uh, they come, comp I'm not gonna paint them. I'm gonna just leave them the way they are and try to apply the decals. We'll see how it goes with one of them. That's kind of where we're heading with that. So now the skeleton log car. I don't have a lot of pictures that uh, show how I built it. This is the first of possibly 12 kits uh, that were issued by Keystone Locomotive Works. And uh, we managed uh, over the years to have uh, assembled a, a pile of those. And um, I've got the basic structural part of it set up uh, to go for a total of nine. I've got three more kits. Here's what the uh, finished product looks like. Now, one of the things that's interesting is that the standard skeleton log car usually had three timbers on the main beam. And uh, unfortunately, the keystone used a scribed piece of uh, wood to put on the top that made it look like it was four timbers. And I thought that was not too good. So that's one element of this. The key to this, though, is the core. Keystone's model came with two pieces of cast metal on the earlier kits. In the later kits, they came out with a piece of steel, which rusted. The two, the two cast ones essentially had an overlap. The machining was not good. If you tried to make it so it was square uh, and smooth, so you could apply the, the uh, wood on the outside. The first car I tried to build ended up to be a 1 64th inch too narrow and nothing would fit properly. You know, I kind of said, well, okay, how am I gonna deal with that? finally figured out that by buying a piece of brass that was um, an eighth of an inch by uh, five eighths or something, half an inch, it's half an inch wide and it's an eighth of an inch thick. You know, I was able to then have a nice straight piece of weighted core for this car. And then there's wood on the sides and there's wood on the top. And then here's a detail of the undersides. I'm playing around with different ideas on how I might uh, do these brake assemblies so they're a little easier to install. It's a little tricky using standard KD couplers, O-scale couplers. You have to essentially glue them into place because you don't have any meat to screw the coupler into. I'm still playing around with how the future cars can be built. Trucks are protocraft, arch bar trucks. They're pretty nice. That's what I've got to show you. Does anybody have any questions? Building a Proto 48 O scale layout? These are a standard o, o scale. He was selling some Proto 48s. He may still have some. So are you building a five foot gauge O scale railroad? No. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a crazy multi-scale guy and I got the rolling stock and locomotives from, from all, all sorts of scales. Anybody else? The uh, refrigerator car, did you have to acquire different details from uh, other manufacturers other than Atlas? You are only seeing part of, of their offering. 
And in some cases I bought parts just because I thought, in case, you know, and in case something fails, pretty much everything I need to put back on that car is available. I think the only thing I got to find is some air hose, uh, air hoses to hang from it. Ellen, where'd you get that log? Is that a rhododendron or a, yeah, what is that? That's a Russ Segner special. He had a box of logs he gave me at some point and that was one of them. I'm not sure where, it, it looks like it might've been something he found in Eastern Washington. It's, it's pretty good size. Nice bark detail. Yeah. So Susan, you said you had, are you ready to go now? This is my first and only box car, stock car that I ever did. It is my cow car. So, well, this is the, the close up view. Um, these are my cows. You can see I spent nearly probably over a month doing this for a competition in our club. There's my own version of cow poop inside of here with some straw. All right, so this is a close up of the, of the signs that I made on the computer, on the printer. I punched out holes, I weathered it so that it looked like a cow car. I was inspired by a song by a local artist um, called Cows Have Guns. And I hope that you will all YouTube it and listen to, uh, his name is Dana Lyons. I have information at the end. Um, but it's about cows that get together and decide that they're not gonna go get made into hamburger. And that, that was my inspiration for this. This is my um, revolutionary guy who is telling the cows they need to run for it. And he was made from a regular cow. I cut him in half and I used, I found a product that's used for wood flooring that makes a really good putty for plastic. So I made him stand up and I gave him a little, little box to stand on and that is a tiny little gun that he's holding. So that was, that was my humor part. Then I got serious. <laughs> then I had to do break detail. And I had never, ever done a, cow, a car before of any kind. The kit that, that Phil found for me to do this was, I, we think it was an Intermountain, but it came with the most detail I've ever seen. I weathered it. I made parts greasy that were supposed to be greasy. I, made, I did everything I possibly could. Most of my information came from this book. This was my Bible for a month. I worked on this car every single day after work, on the weekends. And these were the pages that were my favorites where I could actually see where the parts were underneath the car. The end result was at the competition, we had Jack Hamilton and Dee Voss come and I got second place, which I was pretty impressed comparing all the people that I was competing with have been doing this for their, most of their lives. So I was pretty, pretty excited about that. And then a special mention and inspiration to the song, Cows with Guns by Dana Lyons. It's on YouTube and it's hilarious. So feel free to have a listen when you need a laugh. Phil had to listen to it twice today because I was trying to get inspired again. And that's it, my one and only car. Does anybody have any questions? Good for you. Yeah. I think if you got second place, somebody must have made an awfully good car to have gotten first. Yeah, we have a lot. It's a, this this club is pretty competitive. <laughs> Susan, your car just reeks, and that's a compliment. It just <laughs> looks like it's had real, really has had cattle in there. My gosh, the weathering is just terrific. Well, thank you. I got a real compliment from Phil today when he looked at the car in his hand, and he said, was this a wood kit? Exactly. No, but thank yeah. you. <laughs> uh, what did you use for weathering? Um, I mostly use washes. I, I use acrylic paint and I make a wash out of them. And I just, I love how it comes out. Susan, I appreciate your sense of humor. It blends well with your model railroading. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> they always know I'm going to have something funny. <laughs> The cow poop was really from Jack, um, Jack Dingstad. <laughs> Susan. <was> his idea. <laughs> Susan, you didn't say anything about the all-seeing eye. Oh, yeah. the name of our railroad is the Eastern Sierra Pacific Railroad. 
because it's ESP. So <laughs> the all seeing eye became our logo. Yes. All right. So next up is Joe from Squim, or for people from out of the area, Sequim. Joe's got an awesome layout that uh, from the, in the hills of Virginia, CNO Chessie system and uh, yep. operating layout, but he has some really awesome um, methods for weathering uh, his cars. It looks very realistic in, in photos. So Joe, go ahead. You're ready. Okay. Thanks for, thanks for inviting me. So yes, I, I model 1974 in the mountains of Virginia, the Chesapeake Railroad. I don't scratch build my cars. I don't actually, I, I do ready to, uh, ready to run stuff or kits. I believe the car here is a, I believe this is an inner mountain kit that I, uh, that I worked with, but I love weathering cars. I, that's kind of what I, I really get into. And a few years ago, I bought a, a set of videos by Mike Confalone uh, on how he weathers cars. I think I got it on the Model Railroad Hobbyist website. And so it's about, he does eight cars and it's a good three or four hours worth of video. This car was one of the ones I did after that. And it was one of the first cars I went, I think I'm actually figuring out what I'm doing now, getting to a point where I like what I see. And in fact, after I did this car, I picked it out in particular, I decided to go reweather all 90 box cars and reefers on my, on my layout, which is quite a project. One of the first things I want to talk about is over here, he uses pan pastel a lot. That was one of the things I learned from it. And I think that's pretty well known now. But one of the things he uses is a lot of oil paints. I don't prefer to use oil. I prefer to use anything that's water-based. So what I found is the, these paints from Golden, Golden is the name of the company. They're acrylics, but they are slow drying. You can see that there, slow drying acrylics. That's their open line is what they call it. So if, you, if you're interested in this, what you want to do is find the open line. If, if you find the black at the bottom, that's what tell you that it's the, the open. And the other thing I learned he, he uses is a deer foot brush. So if we go back, the way I learned to do the rust on the roof, the open acrylic paint, which dries, I don't know if it dries as slowly as oil paints because I've never really used oil paints, but it, it takes a long time to dry. And so you put it on there and then use the, the deer foot brush to stipple it. And the stippling is, it takes all of the, uh, the brush marks out and gives you some amount of texture. And so it took me, it, this is two coats to get this kind of coverage right here. That's, that's like a single coat. These are probably all, all umber, this would be the burnt umber um, paint. That's probably just the difference in the, the thickness in terms of getting the different colors. And the other thing he, he shows on his video is how to, to get sort of the streaking. You just put like a dot of paint on there and then use a wet brush to pull the paint through based on how much paint you use and how much you pull through with the water, you can get different effects, different amount of, of uh, thickness. In fact, there you can probably see where I've sort of left the dots a little bit on the, uh, the edge of the roof. By using that open acrylic, I also, these are probably the open acrylics as well. The rust here is probably the open acrylics applied most likely with a toothpick on there. The fact that it dries really slowly it, uh, allows you to use acrylics in a way that it's uh, different. Like if he uses oil paints, I switch to the open acrylic with the, uh, the technique is straight out of what he teaches in his video. One of the other things I, he, he didn't, I think he's probably still using um, doll coat, but I have a problem with doll coat. And one time I had a can I swear it was gloss coat. I mean, I couldn't get it to be uh, dull. And I've also had a problem with dull coat that sometimes I get the can too close and it gets too much on there. So I, I went to my local Michaels and I found this Rumbacher Mott uh, varnish. I, I switched to using that as my uh, matte varnish on the uh, cars. And I thought maybe it was just me who thought it was better. But Burr Stewart came by for an op session once and just asked me out of the blue, if I was still using doll coat, if I'd switch to something else, because he noticed the difference. So I'm very happy with it. The only problem is you can't find it right now. Uh, so I'm probably going to switch to a, the golden as a, a varnish as well. Golden's a bit more expensive. The last thing I wanted to show you is, is this car. So this is a, um, 
I think this is a KD ready to run car. One of the things I also sort of picked up, I, when I was weathering cars before, I would focus on like the big part of the car, like this part or this part. And one of the things I know looking at Mike's is that he spent a lot of time on edges and around the end. So one of the things I learned with the pan pastels is to use uh, an angle brush. It's a really tiny angle brush there. And to use the angle brush to get umber, uh, extra dark type stuff, color. Well, sometimes you use black, but this just looks like it's a very dark brown. And get into the edges around there. Probably use the black under here to get the shadow underneath the, uh, the sill there. Uh, but down under here, probably a little bit of black in there as well. And then use a lot of the dark color around the bottom and around the ends. And to me, what that helps to, at least in my eye, what that does is sort of helps to frame the car a bit and, and allows the, the colors to sort of come through in these areas. He also does a lot with this one last brush, I wish, the half inch, it's just a half inch brush. But he calls it his blending brush. And so he's constantly, when he's using the pan pastels, using the blending brush to pull down the colors and every now and then going sideways to blend them. But those techniques uh, are partly what helped has helped me to learn how to, let's say the pan pastels a little bit more realistically onto the car. So that's what I wanted to show you and wanted to talk about. I hope that made some sense. If there are any, any questions. Joe, what size is your layout? The overall size of layout is 30 feet by 31. It's actually in, it's in a separate, it was a two RV bay garage. Uh, when we bought the when we bought the house here, that was one of the criteria was finding a place big enough for a layout. The good news is I have my own building. The bad news is it's a separate building, and at times, you know, you, you sort of have to get dressed to go work in the layout, and and I get to clean it all by myself. Joe, I'm particularly impressed with your Norfolk and Western uh, boxcar. I I really I really like the weathering on it. I think that's very effective. Thank you. Do you have any special techniques for getting at the trucks and keeping the paint off the treads and in the journals? And because the trucks look really nice. So I usually paint the with a brush. I usually paint the the truck grimy black. I, I forget who said that they had the floquel stash. I have a polyscale stash for a long time. So grimy black there, and this is uh, and then I hand paint the the wheels. I often take them out. And to be honest, I sometimes do get paint in there because I'm sloppy. So I must have been smart enough to take the picture that didn't show that. Um, but then I, I probably there's some amount of pan pastels in there as well. Joe's cars are really awesome looking. I've operated on his layout a few times and and uh, just seeing a full consist of weathered cars like this. It's, you know, you get up close to it. It's like being right next to the prototype. It's really cool. Do you weather your locomotives also? I do, yes. Similarly, the only thing is I don't, I get really, if this was a locomotive, I get really dicey about putting spraying in towards the wheels. So the, my trucks there tend to be pretty simplistic, just sort of washes and stuff that I can control. I don't even paint the wheels, to be honest with you. It just sort of freaks me out. If my engines run well, I'm just really happy with it, you know? <laughs> My big point is, is I'm trying to build a railroad. And that's what really motivates me is to build a railroad that I can operate and that looks like what I, what I want it to look like, as it were, what makes me happy. I've scratch built buildings uh, because I, it, when, if I need to, but I have never scratch built a car because I don't, I don't need to scratch build a car to get the railroad I want. Well, you picked a good era that has, you know, a boatload of, available rolling stock that you can yeah. that you can choose from it does although it likes like anything you pick has its interesting points right the 1974 theoretically the running boards are supposed to be gone in 1974 now i have seen plenty of pictures of, of box cars that still had running boards after that any era you pick you have to figure out what is what works in that era right so is your uh, railroad completely diesel 
Yes, much to my wife's chagrin, she wants me to get the Shea engine working. This is Cass, West Virginia. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Cass, West Virginia, but they have Shea engines still running now for their, uh, their tourist trains. And we went on it once. So I have, a, I have a Shea engine and she keeps asking me why it isn't running yet. I want to know why it's not running, Joe. What's, <laughs> what's up with that? It, it's all a matter of time, right? Where do you want to spend your time? All right. So lastly, in Owen 30, we'd have to deal with, you know, the Bachman stock of cars and they're, they're plastic models. The weathering is somewhat difficult to achieve different from, from wood modeling where, you know, if you wanted to create a, a heavily weathered car in wood, you just simply keep sanding the paint down until you got down to the bare wood and it would show, show that wood. But with a plastic car, it's a little bit different a little bit more difficult to get to that same type of detail. What I use is um, I use primer, gray primer that works good for plastics. I think I found like the Krylon stuff. You can get it at uh, Walmart or, or Home Depot or whatever that works. I stick with acrylic paints like Joe does for the most part. I also use hairspray. That's the, that's the magical um, ingredient to make your paint come off and provide different layers. Q-tips and stuff, water and towels, you know, washes and powders, you just typical weathering stuff for the end. So the first step is um, primering the car. I took everything apart and then primered it um, and wiping it down real good and making sure there's no fingerprints and stuff on it. I just do a basic wash just to, you know, kind of mix up the undercoat because this, the primer and whatever you put on top of that primer is going to basically be the undercoat that gets revealed once you start scraping the, the surface paint paint off of the uh, off the surface. And so once everything's dry, what I do is I take some hairspray and spray that all over the car. And it, it doesn't really do anything to the paint. It just provides a barrier between layers. And it only takes 10 minutes to dry, which is good. And then after the hairspray is dry, I go ahead and airbrush, and you could use a rattle can. But I go ahead and airbrush my boxcar color on the whole body and then let that dry. I noted here that you could do brush on, but I don't, I have never tried that. Um, I don't like using a brush on large surfaces just because it, you know, brush uh, painting can be kind of uneven. So after the paint's dried thoroughly, I usually let it sit for a day. Then you can come back with Q-tips and toothpicks or a stiff brush with water and you can gently start to remove the top coat to reveal that base coat underneath, which is your simulated bare wood in, in the areas of your choice. So this, you know, this picture here just shows getting that wet and starting to, to rub down the paint to reveal the surfaces underneath. And this is what you can achieve doing that. Looks like wood showing from underneath the car. And then on the roof detail, the running board, I kind of went heavy on that to reveal the, the uh, wood simulated wood surface underneath, and then the areas on the grab irons where those would get worn a little bit heavier, scrape that paint down. So then I start doing the weathering portion using your typical uh, pastels. That's um, very common now. Some of this, uh, like this one, the edge sheen on the metal objects, I actually use a uh, HB pencil to highlight those metal edges to make it look like the paint is kind of worn away, showing bare metal underneath those edges. And that was a technique I picked up from uh, armor modeling years and years and years ago. And then this is one of my cars with some light paint wear on it. A little bit different, you know, like the where the door would have been open for long periods of time, you know, kind of change the paint tone underneath where the door would be sitting if it was open. I just used pastels to kind of change the, the coloration or the tone. The uh, lower portion of the car was airbrushed just to give it that mist of dirt on the bottom. And this is another, another view of that car. And then this is one with heavy paint wear. I took a lot of material off to make it look like a, a well-worn car has been sitting outside for a long time. And then here's a picture of a prototype uh, from a DNR GW a car I kind of got some inspiration from that's been sitting out, obviously been sitting outside for many, many years. So I kind of replicated that. My car's a little different color, but trying to get the same type of effect with the, with the bare wood 
like that. Rich, can I interrupt? Yeah, go ahead. What did you use to rub the siding with to reveal the undercoat? Uh, a brush or your finger or a rag? Or... Right here. So I mostly use a Q-tip. I got it. I got it. Yep. Q-tip or something like I have a I have a couple of paint brushes that I just I chop the bristles all the way down to to nubs. So they're only like a, a sixteenth of an inch, maybe an eighth of an inch. So they're kind of kind of stiff, but they're not going to scratch the surface and it just get saturated real good with water. And it, yeah, the paint will come right off. You have to be careful though. You just gotta go, you go a little bit at a time because you can get carried away and take you know big gobs of paint off if you if you're not careful. You don't need to use alcohol or anything like that. You could use just alcohol. Water. You could, but use just alcohol. water work. Yeah, water. These, I mean, these are just straight acrylic paints. When you spray with a hairspray, do you have to worry about it getting too thick or anything? Or so the hairspray actually goes on pretty thin. The trace some a stuff that I found, it it goes on fairly thin. You don't have to worry about it building up much of a layer. And this is painted over the top of that hairspray. It really doesn't add that much thickness. This is an O scale. So, you know, this is a larger car. I would experiment if you're going to use this, you know, on a smaller scale. Uh -huh. I would definitely experiment before you, you know, committed to something like this with the, with the smaller scales, with smaller details. Because, you know, the, the ribs here, these are probably uh, an eighth of an inch wide. So there's plenty of space and, and detail here to soak up paint and whatever else you're doing. Whereas the smaller scales, just a little bit of thickness can actually hide some of the, some of the details. It's a really interesting idea. I never would have thought of it. Yeah, I've done this. I've actually done this technique a few times on other projects to like create different layers of um, rust. I have a couple critters, some old vehicles that uh, I would spray, spray the base coat with a, with a rust colored primer, put the, uh, the hairspray down and then spray a regular color on that and then do the same technique to reveal the rust patches underneath the base coat layer or underneath the, the paint layer. And there's a couple of, uh, there's one project, I did three different layers. So I had a rust color when the thing was new layer of paint and then the, the second hand layer of paint. So there was actually two layers that were revealed at just depending on how much paint you took off which gave it, you know, really interesting looking effect. Rich, are you going to put this in the uh, 4D um, library? Yes. Good. Yes. We can consult this at any time. Yes. Okay, thank you.